I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast. And today, as always, anyone who watches this show knows, again, we're always trying to do something different and something unusual. And today's going to be a little bit unusual. As you see, we are not on video, which has not been the norm for a while, even though we started out only audio. So we're kind of going back old school. And we have on a guest who is, I guess you could say anonymous. We don't have his his true name. And that, that's by his choice. And he is known, I suppose, by Introibo Adaltari Dei. He has a a blog, a very, very well respected and well regarded blog. I've seen I've seen priests share it. I've seen many Catholics share it. Very, very well known and well regarded. Um, I don't know if it's quite up there with Mario Dirksen uh, level in terms of of being known, but it's very high quality stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit. But our primary conversation for today is to discuss one of the first, perhaps the first hero of the, of the traditional Catholic movement in the 20th century, a priest who came out in 1964 against the changes of the Novus Ordo. So really an incredible story. We're going to get talking about that priest. But first, intro Ebo, I, I don't have a first name for you, so that's what I'm going to call you today. So if you want to give a brief description, not of yourself, but of your blog, and then we'll get right into this, this heroic priest. Sure. Thank you for having me, Kevin. And uh, as I uh, was introduced, this is Intrui Wabaltari Day. Uh, I'm an attorney in New York City. I was also a science teacher here before going into law school. My blog is basically uh, one post per Monday, and the post covers anything involving what's going on in the world from a traditional Catholic point of view. So it can be anything from, for example, uh, pornography, like I was talking about this week, and uh, how bad it is for our society, because we don't hear that anymore in the uh, in the Vatican II sect. Uh, and it'll also cover things such as phenism, such as homolonism, such as anything else that touches on the Catholic world today without a pope in the state of City of Acante. And so I try to uh, mix it up, keep a lot of topics out there, and make it interesting. And it's something that I, I've seen around for, I think, years. I, and I, I see it pop up all the time. And since you're anonymous, I, I, it's really made me, I'm always guessing, like, I, I wonder if I know this guy. Or I, I bet you it's him. Or I bet you it's him. <laughs> and, and it turns out it's not. It's someone I, I, I never had heard of or had met. So I'm really, really glad to have you on. Um, and it's an honor, and, and I hope that perhaps in the future we can do more. And, and I'm really excited about today's podcast because it's, it's really, again, you, you hear many podcasts talking about Archbishop Took and Archbishop Lefebvre, and rightly so. They were, at least in many regards, true heroes of, of the traditional Catholic you know, movement. The movement's not the right word, but of traditional Catholicism in the 20th century. And so today we're going to talk about Father DePaul. I, I guess the best place to start is at the beginning. I mean, what, what can you tell us about this heroic priest? Well, he was the priest who converted me. Uh, I was born in, uh, just before the council ended in 1965. And around 13 years old, uh, my parents were not practicing Catholics, um, although they were raised as such. And what had happened was uh, they didn't like the changes. They were very confused, and they just basically gave up on religion. And I happened to come across, when I was about 13 years old, I came across, my father had a Sunday Missal from pre-Vatican II, and he had the works of St. Thomas Aquinas. Started reading those. And I became convinced that God was real and the Catholicism was true. So I went to the local Vatican II sect parish and became, well, I guess uh, a waiter at that point because they didn't have altar boys. The Novus Bogus was uh, basically, you know, uh, guitars and strumming and dancing. And that's what I had a hard time comprehending is that what I was attracted to in the books was not what I was getting at the church. As a matter of fact, it was the very antithesis of that. And uh, it made me upset. So what I would do is uh, sometimes I would come in and I would uh, show the priests. And they were validly ordained from before Vatican II. And I'd say, you know, how come this is different from that? And they would always dismiss me saying, you're just a kid, you don't understand. They would never give me an answer. Uh, one time the priest got so angry, and that's when I finally left. He said, he said, why don't you just get the hell out of here? literally what he said to me and so i did and i said this can't possibly be the catholic church and i didn't know and remember this is the this is a time before internet the time 
before there was anything. So I really didn't know what to do at this point. I was really in a, you know, I was in a kind of existential crisis. This was after a couple of years. I was going to, I was about 15, 15 and a half years old at the time. And I was going to a Vatican II sex school only because in New York City, where I'm from, uh, during that time, during the late 70s, there was uh, racial tension. Uh, African Americans were coming into neighborhoods where they had never been before, and there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of gangs and there were a lot of fighting going on in the local high schools, public school high schools. Uh, the only places that basically dodged that were the Catholic schools because they could expel anybody that they wanted to a public school can. So uh, I got a scholarship. Um, I grew up rather poor because my father had PTSD from World War II, couldn't do much, and the Veterans Administration did not treat uh, their veterans anywhere near what they do today. And I was sad. My father, you know, uh, fought the Imperial Japanese and uh, did a lot for his country but got treated very shabbily when he came back. My mother had been sickly her whole life. So we lived in basically Section 8 housing, and things were, uh, were were poor for us. We couldn't afford anything, but luckily I got a scholarship. So I got a scholarship, and I went there, and if anyone uh, didn't lose their faith in the high school, it was a miracle. Um, you had a... It was run by the Society of Mary, and... You would think these people are dedicated to the Blessed Mother, she who is without sin, she who is purity herself. They were the they were just incredibly the opposite of that. Um, the priest who was ordained in sixty four uh, would offer mass on a uh, on a, on a broken down table. If you want to call it that? And when I say mass, I use that in quotation marks. And he would, at the offering, they would offer up uh, footballs and baseballs that the sports teams would win. Uh, this is in 1980. 1980. Uh, he would make up his own words. He would make, you know, does anybody want to say anything? It was, it was really ridiculous. And the brother, one of the brothers there, who's, uh, I'll say, uh, Brother Benjamin, that wasn't his name. But he was, but he was, he took his, he professed his vows, his perpetual vows in 1954, so he knows better. Told jokes that were so vulgar, so vile, sexual jokes. Uh, one about the rape of a woman that had anyone else said these things who was a layman, uh, they probably would have been beaten by the fathers half to death had they said that in front of their, their daughters. This was a co ed school. And uh, when I, when my father, I told my father one of the jokes and remember he was a World War II uh, army sergeant. This was not a guy who was used to hearing things. The six foot and 50 pound World War II vet blushed. The only time I ever saw him do that, he said, he said that the teenagers, girls too. And I said, well, dad, you're going to do something about it. You're going to say, and he says, well, and he, he, it was a long pause. He knew I was right. And he says, well, he's a brother. And that's one of the ways the Vatican II sect got away with what they did. The modernists who had infiltrated prior to the council were banking on this uh, respect, which was rightfully due, rightfully due to those who profess religion and who are, you know, an Alpha Christus if you're a priest, uh, and the nuns, of course, who are also, you know, um, married, you know, brides of Christ. But what they did was they used this um, an exaggerated uh, respect for the clergy to take advantage. Uh, he should have been taken to task. I don't blame my father because that's how he was raised, but he should have been taken to task and held to an even higher standard than a layman. But he wasn't. And uh, one of the girls I went to high school with, by the time she was 17, had three abortions. And uh, nothing was said about it. Nothing was said about it. We never heard about why. As a matter of fact, in the, the uh, in my senior year, uh, the, the religion class told us that point blank. It was, by the way, by an ex-nun. She was a nun who had uh, married. Um, she didn't even get a dispensation from her vows. She just left. And they put her in charge of the religion class for seniors. And the two questions that we had to answer were, were why... Uh, Contra artificial contraception and why divorce and remarriage are ideals and can change church can change the teaching 
So uh, I'll get back to that. But, but by that time, I was a traditionalist because it was 1981 when I was converted. This was 1983. And uh, I wrote basically five, five uh, pages explaining about why they could never change and why the One True Church of Christ could never teach such things. So I was called into the office. I was told that I either had to retract it or I would fail. So I said, fail me. And they did, but I passed with a 65 for the year. And it was simply, this is what was going on at the time, immediately after Vatican II. This is what was going on here in New York City. And it was just, uh, a, a, thankfully, you know, I did get a scholarship to college because when I explained in my admissions that this was, they didn't care. I went to a secular college, so they didn't really care about my religion grade. And that's what saved me. But I would not... Uh, you know, I was not going to bow to the modernism that was there. So this is the this is what I was surrounded with. So let me back up a bit. So finally, at 16 years old, my father always read the New York Times, and he had the Sunday Times, and I would page through it, and all of a sudden I see a half page ad, looking for the traditional Latin Mass, true Catholicism, come to Westbury, Long Island. Holy Sacrifice of the Mass offered by Father Gomar Albert de Poor, JCD. JCD means a U.S. Canonicist Doctor, which is a doctor of canon law. He's the canonist. He was an approved canonist from before Vatican II. And I looked at it, and I was, wait a second. And I went back to the missile, and I was like, yeah, I got to have to go here. So I told my parents I wanted to go to Westbury. And they're like, you want to go to Long Island? I said, yeah. And they're like, well, you're 16 now. I guess if you want to go, you can. So I found out how to get to, you know, take the subway to the Long Island Railroad and Long Island Railroad out to Westbury. I got my, uh, I, had the one, I had one decent suit. So I got my decent suit on. And it was on Sunday, August 9th, 1981. I remember the day. And I got out to Westbury. From the Westbury train station, it's about a mile to walk. So I walked a mile and I got there. I was greeted at the door. Hi, how are you? And have you ever been here? You've, you've never been here before? No. He gave me some literature. I came in and I knew right then and there when Father Paul for the Mess, that's what I was looking for, that I had found the church. And there was no going back for me after that. Um, I, I gave some questions to Father DePaul. Uh, I wrote them down on a piece of paper. I gave them to the uh, to the usher. The usher took them into Father DePaul and the following uh, actually went on the Feast of the Assumption which was that Saturday, and uh, I got back a whole list of answers, not, you know, get that get the eight out or, uh, you know, being dismissive. So uh, I, I decided I was going to stay here, and uh, my baptism was valid, having taken place in 1965. I signed the um, profession of the Catholic faith. Uh, and I signed the anti-modernist oath, and on November 1st of 1981, at the age of 16, I became a traditionalist, and my parents, believe it or not, a year later, followed after me, and they died in the faith with me. Wow. So, well, I haven't died yet, but they died in the faith. <laughs> I, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so you did so, all, of uh, this, all of this in the meantime as a teenager, and that, that's that's pretty impressive. Well, I was the, it was the grace of God, really. Uh, I take credit for none of it. I mean, you just led me to those books, and he led me to uh, thinking about things that really count in life, which is basically what really matters is gaining heaven and nothing else matters. If you think about it, what really matters besides that, that's our ultimate purpose is the beatific vision. And that is what we have to focus on. That is what our whole life should point towards. Whatever else we do in life should get us to that goal. And if it's bringing us closer to that goal, well, then we're doing something good. If it's taking us away from that goal, uh, we shouldn't be doing it. And that's how I try to run my life. Fortunately, it doesn't always go that way, but I try. And that's what God asks from us, that we try our best. And Father DePaul was instrumental in that, is that he answered a lot of questions. Now, he was an amazing man. Uh, Gomar Albert DePaul was the youngest of eight children to a Belgian family. His father was a very wealthy man, Mr. Desiree DePaul. Mr. Desiree DePaul was, like me, uh, an educator and a lawyer. He was the forefront of the Belgian social movement the Catholic social movement, to inculcate Catholic values throughout Belgium. Uh, 
and his mother was Mrs. Anna, and her maiden name was Van Overloop. They were the Belgian, Belgium, for those of you who aren't uh, acquainted with the country, not that, I've, uh, not that I am Belgium, I am not, uh, but uh, the northern part of Belgium is known as, uh, the people there are known as Flems, and the Flems have, speak uh, Flemish, and they have Dutch customs. Uh, in the south, they're known as Walloons, and they, ha they speak French and have French customs. So Father de Poe was from the north, he spoke Flemish. And he decided at a young age that he wanted to be uh, a priest. Now, he had an older brother, Nestor, who became a Franciscan priest. Father Adamar was his, um, was his uh, the name given him by the general superior of the Franciscans. Uh, they don't have, you know, like Father, uh, Father Damien, his real name is Joseph de Buster. Uh, that was his Silesian name was Damien. So his Franciscan name was uh, Father Adamar. And he, his, the oldest child, which was his oldest sister, was a girl. She became Mother Marie. She was a medical doctor and went in the Belgian Congo and spent 50 years of her life there. They, you know, you hear a lot about Mother Teresa, but Mother Marie was by far greater than Mother Teresa insofar as not only did she do all these acts of charity. Uh, I'm not saying, by the way, that Mother Teresa isn't in heaven because we know that charity cover the multitude of sin and so i i believe that someone who is that charitable i i think she may have gotten in but the thing to remember is this uh when mother Teresa said such things as uh, i don't want to uh, convert hindus i want to make a hindu a better hindu a buddhist a better buddhist and Muslim a better Muslim. Uh, that's not catholicism and uh, i don't know she became before catholicism but she should have known better uh mother marie uh, was very different. She did convert people and wanted to convert people, and she knew that was the mission of the church. Yet you'll never hear about her, unfortunately, uh, post Vatican II. So he came from an illustrious family, and he was uh, his father had asked, when he told his father he wanted to be a diocesan priest, he told him he would give him his blessing, but he had to make one promise that he would never take money or a stipend for anything he did, but he passed it on to another priest or someone else, but he would never take it. His father wouldn't explain why, but he made that oath and he never accepted a single penny for the sacraments. And he said, I'll take care of you when I'm gone. And he did. He became quite wealthy when his father passed, passed on, which is why he was able to thumb his nose at everybody that he didn't need the support of the diocesan bishop or anybody else. Uh, you know, the CTM uh, out in here in Long Island, I would say if I had to take a guess, it's around at least $35 million with the property and everything he invested. So uh, he didn't have to depend on anybody for anything. But uh, when he went in, he uh, first he went into the Belgian inf infantry um, because they needed him. And he was taken prisoner at the Battle of Dunkirk. And he was in uh, the, he was kept in a concentration camp and he and his best friend decided they were going to escape. And uh, while he was scaling the wall, he got shot in. He got shot in the lower leg, which is why later on in life he couldn't genuflect at mass. He had to do a deep bow instead. It was very painful for him, and it got worse with time. Those types of injuries don't get better with age. Uh, he and his friend made it to the home of a German woman, and she told him to get, get down, and she put him underneath the uh, the kitchen. And when the Germans came, uh, she said she had never seen them. And uh, she wound up saving Father DePaul's life and, and that of his friend. So uh, they were able to escape and uh, they met up with some allies and uh, the war ended. And he was able to, uh, well, even before the war ended, he was able to return to the seminary where he was ordained on April 12th, 1942 at the age of 23. Uh, he had dispensation from Pope Pius XII. So he got started very early. He was very, very intelligent. He was born October 11th of 1918, and it was his 44th birthday on which the Vatican Council opened in 1962. So uh, in the meantime, what he had done, uh, he was ordained for the Diocese of uh, Ghent, Belgium, and it was the Auxiliary Bishop Bishop Leo de Kessel, which had inspired him to become a priest. And when he had, 
become a priest and was administering to the people after World War II, he had a desire to come to the United States of America and experience what that was because Belgium had been liberated, of course, by the Americans. And he came here and he was uh, excardinated from the Diocese of Ghent and incarnated into the Archdiocese of New York City. And he was in the Bronx at St. Clair's Church in the Northern Bronx, uh, where he met the Cuneo family, which would be instrumental in him setting up on Long Island. So uh, he became very close friends with Cardinal Spellman. And uh, Cardinal Spellman was one of the few anti-modernists at the council, though he became compromised at the council, sad to say. And Father DePaul wanted to become a canonist. He wanted to continue his studies. So he was excardinated from New York City and incarnated into the Archdiocese of Baltimore. In uh, 1955, he completed his uh, JCD. He was an approved canonist. And he was uh, the Archbishop of Baltimore at that time was Francis Keogh, who Father DePaul described as saintly. Very few people would he ever call saintly. And he was the one who was never given the Cardinal's hat, the only Archbishop of Baltimore, to the best of my knowledge and belief, who was never promoted the Cardinal. And Father DePaul said it was because everyone from the United States was bad mouthing him because they knew what an anti modernist he was and they didn't want him being in any conclave. So he, be, he remained an archbishop. And it was uh, the arch, under the archbishop that Father DePaul was treated extremely well. He put him in charge of admissions for the seminary, St. Um, St. Mary's Major Seminary in the Archdiocese of uh, Baltimore. And he was also professor of canon law and moral theology as well as Latin. And he said that at that time, he had told me uh, that of all the applications that came across his desk, more than 85% he would put in the paper shredder. Because after he had met them, or even before, he says he knew there wasn't something right about them. Uh, many had same-sex attraction, and many were modernists. And he was there, he says, there's no one, he says, who's going to be a sodomite, there's nobody who's going to be a modernist who's getting into the seminary. If he had any questions, he also expelled several of the students who were there at the time to make sure they never got to the priesthood. Well, as soon as, uh, so then he was called to the council and there were a couple of bishops that wanted him as a peritus. A peritus is Latin, basically meaning a theological expert. To be a peritus, you must be either a theologian with a doctorate in canon, a uh, doctorate in canon law, as he did have, a, uh, excuse me, canonist with a doctorate in canon law, JCD, or a theologian with what's called an STD, which is a uh, doctorate in sacred theology. So he was chosen at 44 years old to go there. And when he went to the council, uh, he was very good friends also with Cardinal Ottaviani, which was very interesting in my time with Father de Paul is that when you read about these people in books uh, that we read today, he actually knew them all. Wow. He knew them all personally. He knew Cardinal Ottaviani. So when he was telling his stories about Cardinal Ottaviani, this wasn't something he read in a book or he heard secondhand. This is something he experienced personally. You know, he knew all the characters. He had personally met Montini. He had personally met Roncalli. He had personally met Pius XII. He had personally met Pius XI, going back to when he was a little boy. So these are all figures that led up to the council or in the council that he knew personally. And he uh, was he knew about, he knew many of the theologians in the preparatory commission, which the original schemata, the original schemas, uh, were thoroughly orthodox and totally Catholic. And the Rhineland bishops, with the help of Roncalli, now they had a uh, a non-pope on the throne. They had a, they had a false pope, and he sided with them in scrapping the schemata that they had spent so much time putting all this time and effort into. Uh, for example, uh, if you ever get a chance, I've read the uh, proposed schemata on the church, which was an amazing piece. It, it, it really took the doctrine that was elaborated by Pope Pius XII and Mystici Corporis and took it to another level and made everything very, very clear. And that was destroyed overnight. And they had the modernist theologians from the Rhineland. 
the, the, the ringleader, if you want to call him that, was the detestable Joseph Cardinal Frings from Germany. And he, Al Frink, Cardinal Al Frink from the Netherlands, those were the, uh, some, of the, some of the biggest names who were the ringleaders of the modernists. And they were waiting for this opportunity. And what they would do to placate the ones who they knew were not full-blown modernists. By the way, America was one of the worst places. In America, there was only approximately five bishops that were anti-modernist. That was all. The rest were full-blown modernists. So uh, they would put things into the conciliar documents to make it seem like it was acceptable. And the way they did it, the, you know, they're always saying, well, how did these guys fall for the heresy? And the answer I'm going to give you is uh, short. I mean, we can go into it at some other time, but here's what it is. It was done under the guise of authority. Well, if John Paul, if John the 23rd is saying, it was really, how many people knew that John the 23rd wasn't a real pope at that time? It's easy to be Monday morning quarterback and say, well, he was an, you know, he wasn't a true pope. Well, in 1962, would you really have believed that? There wasn't really heresy expressed until 19... Yeah, we knew that there was shenanigans at... And most people didn't even pay attention. There were shenanigans at the conclave, but how many really, you know, looked into that? And I'm not saying I'm a proponent of the Siri theory, but something did happen at that count, at that conclave. And who came out, you know, by their fruits thou shalt know them? Uh, yeah, whoever... Uh, Grand Kali came out, he was not... He had been censured. He was teaching occult theories in 1925 of Rudolf Steiner and was pulled out of his teaching position. And who rehabilitated him? Well, you know, uh, he was rehabilitated. Uh, uh, he was rehabilitated ultimately uh, after he really, he basically rehabilitated himself after he became uh, the alleged Pope. And when Montini came, the uh, first thing he did was rehabilitate all the censured theologians in the Pope Pius XII. Names like Kung, Skillabakes, uh, 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 Conger, I mean, all of these guys who had been censured were welcomed and put in positions of authority. And right away, Father DeBoer smelled a rat. Uh, so he knew that things were, something horrible was about to happen. And in these documents, they would put things that sounded very orthodox. For example, uh, uh, if you go to paragraph uh, number four of Concilium, it says very clearly, uh, in faithful and sacred council declares that Holy Mother Church holds all lawfully acknowledged rights to be of equal right and dignity, that she wishes to preserve them in the future and to foster them in every way. Now, of course, uh, that would hold true for the traditional mass, wouldn't it? That was recognized, right? Uh, the Latin language is to be preserved. Uh, there should be no innovations unless it is truly needed. And so these were the sops that were thrown to those gullible enough under the guise of authority. I shouldn't even say gullible. Those were the ones, that's what made them cave in. But Father DePaul, like I said, smelled a rat, and in 1964, uh, he started ra publicly raising the flag of resistance, saying that this nothing good is going to come of this council. Nothing good is coming of this council. And that's when Montini had come in. And Montini was one of the worst of all time. By the way, you know, Roncalli is now a saint. Uh, Montini is a saint. Uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, Botila is a saint. I'm surprised Bergoglio just doesn't make him and Ratzinger, uh, you know, a saint and do away with the requirement of being dead. So, uh, we, we even got to have, uh, uh, Luciani beatified. So it's ridiculous. You know, do you realize that from the end of Trent until 1958, we had exactly two canonizations of popes and one beatification. And now everybody from Vatican II is a saint, even though uh, the church is on decline like never before. Uh, try to figure that one out. So he made what's called the Catholic Traditionalist Manifesto. And he declared uh, the Catholic Traditionalist Movement. He actually incorporated it with the help of Cardinal Spellman, the United States of America, as a non-profit religious organization. 
And he, what he wanted to do was try to stop everything in its tracks. And uh, he said, what he did was something, but now people will bash him for it, but it's not, it's not something that they understand why he did it. What he had done was brilliant. I'm going to give you an analogy to a friend of mine here in New York. I had a friend of mine I graduated law school with who became a New York State legislator. And New York State in 2011 legalized sodomite marriage, be quote-unquote marriage, four years prior to the Supreme Court decision. And when they were fighting, and of course, Andrew Cuomo, who claims to be a uh, devout Catholic and whose Vatican II bishop gives him communion, Every week, despite of the fact that without an annulment, he's shacking up with another woman and openly supports uh, abortion on demand and sodomite marriages, they have no problem giving him the Novus Bogus Cracker. So uh, he was pushing for this. And in the assembly, where my friend was, there's the assembly in the state senate, he was in the assembly, there's 150 members, he was Republican, he was asked to speak against the same-sex marriage bill. So what he did was, uh, and I, when I asked him about it, when he told me why he did it, it was brilliant. What he did was he put up, uh, he put up a bill saying that we're going to get, what they were saying, what the sodomites were saying is that it's not fair because we don't have all the rights that married couples have. So what he said was this, okay, I will sit down with you right now and I will make sure, so he was an attorney as well, you know, I'll sit down with your attorneys on the Democratic side, we'll, we'll put together what's called a New York State Domestic Relationship Bill, and you will have every single right that a married couple has, except it won't be called marriage. It'll be called the New York State Domestic uh, Partnership. They went crazy in the chamber. He, uh, he was spit on. They had to bring in the police. You know, they had to call in the guards, and uh, they were calling him, you know, uh, homophobic and, and all these names. And he actually had a couple of threats against his life uh, later on and against his family. They were going to stick his kid with a, with a hypodermic needle, give him AIDS. Uh, these are things he was up against. I said to him, I said, why did you choose that? You know, he says, he said to me, what did you want me to do? Do you really want me to go there? I said, if, have I, had I used, uh, I'd say that, uh, you know, marriages between a man and a woman and a, you know, and a Catholic or whatever. He says, uh, here's what you'd see. Uh, Assemblyman uh, is a religious fanatic who wants to impose his morality on the state of New York. That's what you would have seen. He says, what I did was expose them. If they really want rights, I gave them the rights. The only thing I didn't give them was the nomenclature, the name. So why were they so vociferous against me? And I'll tell you why. Because I expose what they really want. They really don't want the rights. Because I offered that to them. They want to change the institution of marriage. And they want to make it into something. And that's the reason they're against me. And anyone who looks at what I did will see that clearly. Become uh, a law for the Republican states, senators from the Senate cave. And one of the uh, that one of the so-called uh, bishops or the cardinal here from New York City did anything to stop them. So going back to Father DePaul, what he did with his Catholic Traditionalist Manifesto, he said, "You can have your," and he called it his the Hootenanny Liturgy. Because you can have the Hootenanny Liturgy. He says all we ask is that every single parish be permitted to have one traditional Latin Roman Catholic Mass according to the 1958 Missal under Pope Pius XII. That's all we ask. And of course, it was like, no, you can't do this. And, uh, and what he was doing was he was exposing them for the fact that it's two different faiths. They can't coexist. They would never allow it to coexist. And you see Francis doing that now. That they have to close down all the places and take out all the traditional Latin masses, even though they're invalid anyway, because ninety percent of those jokers are invalidly ordained anyway. Uh, but that's they represent a different ecclesiology. They represent different moral values. They represent everything that is different, and because of that, you know, uh, the light and the darkness can't coexist. Neither can the true and the false coexist. And Father DePaul knew that. 
and he was reviled for it. But he had the backing of Cardinal Ottaviani. And so he sent the Catholic Traditional Manifesto to every single bishop in the world, literally, at his own expense. And uh, he made it public on March 15, 1965. Uh, he went back, by the way, in 19. He was using the 1962 missile on January 1st, 1965. He went back to the exclusive use of this 58 because he wanted to do everything as it was under Pope Pius XII. When he died in uh, October 9th of 1958, he said, "Whatever was done at that time, I would continue to do. Whatever he forbade, I would continue to uh, uh, to not allow either." <clears throat> and he was trying to get people together. He also had the idea that every traditional Roman Catholic, should starve the churches. He gave them a card, and uh, he tried this in several parishes. When he came back to the United States, he was still. Uh, he went to Baltimore and said, we will withhold money until there was at least one traditional Latin Roman Catholic Mass here every Sunday. But nobody would go through with it. Very few did. So it failed. So he was trying to do everything he could to look like he had... Um, Yet he was not an extremist. He wanted to believe. He wanted people to show. He wanted to show people that they were the extremists, and he had to tread carefully. I don't know. You know, had he said, "I don't believe this guy is the Pope" or whatever, I don't know how that would have gone over. And eventually, he realized that uh, uh, the Cardinal Archbishop of Baltimore at that time, after Cardinal Kehoe died. The Feast of the Immaculate Conception in 1961, Father DePauw said Our Lady took him so he wouldn't have to see what was coming. And they took the uh, modernist dictator of Bridgeport, Connecticut, a detestable human being called Lawrence Sheehan, who became cardinal almost immediately. And Cardinal Sheehan, the first thing he did was pull Father DePauw out of his position as rector, as uh, director of admissions, he put in a 27-year-old priest just ordained for one year, who was uh, known to be friendly to those who have same-sex attraction. And it's no, uh, I don't think it's a concept, it's a, uh, it's a happy coincidence that uh, that seminary today is known as the Pink Palace. And that's, that's when the ball got rolling there. Uh, he was forbidden from teaching certain of his courses. He was told he had to change the curriculum that he couldn't teach that the church was the one true church of Christ anymore, uh, that, you know, uh, that other religions were, uh, you know, uh, were incomplete. See, incomplete. And that was going along with the new ecclesiology that was being advanced at the council. And so um, Father Paul wound up quitting. And he just walked out and he said, I can't do this anymore. And he had the, the, the first bishop to come out. Before there was a Tuck, before there was a Le, before there was a Lefebvre, before there was a Mendez, before there was anybody, he sent out the uh, the 256 bishops said they would support him if he came out publicly. If he came out publicly, they would support him in what he did. So when the time came, uh, three bishops, only three, stuck up from Ottaviani stuck up from Cardinal Bacci stuck up from. And the only bishop, non-cardinal, stuck up was uh, His Excellency Bishop Blaise Kurz, the uh, exiled bishop of uh, Yongchow, China. He was born in uh, West Germany. He was the only Rhineland bishop who refused to give in to Franks. And Father, he and Father DePaul had become very close friends at the council. And he put out a dec declaration on May 22nd, 1966, becoming bishop moderator of the Catholic traditionalist movement. And Cardinal, um, Cardinal Sheehan went ballistic and ordered Father DePort to come back. See, what happened was this. Uh, bishop Kurz was uh, consecrated at the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica in 1939 by His Holiness Pope Pius XII himself with two co-consecrating archbishops. And he was the first ordinary of the diocese of Yongchow, China. And when the Red Chinese came in, he was told he had to leave and escape. And he barely escaped with his life. He took refuge in the Vatican. And Pius XII gave him a personal prelature. He had ordinary jurisdiction. 
It was allowed to do everything that a diocesan bishop does, except for consecrate other bishops. So uh, with this in mind, he he went to Cardinal Sheehan and he said, you know, Father Paul has been a thorn in your side. Why don't you excardinate him and I'll take him under my personal Episcopal jurisdiction? So it was done. And it was done. Uh, it was uh, ratified in Rome by Cardinal Ottaviani. And so when Bishop Kurz had taken on the Catholic traditions movement, and Father DePaul wound up buying an Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox Bishop in Westbury wanted to get rid of his chapel. And he sold it in 1968 for a whopping $39,000 for which he paid cash. And he took it over and Bishop Kurz consecrated it as a Catholic uh, chapel where the one true mass would, and sacraments would continue to be offered. When he took on Father DePaul, Sheehan said that he didn't really sign the documents and that he had to come back. They ordered him to come back. And he said that if he didn't come back, he would be suspended. So Bishop Curtis took out a full page ad in the New York Times and in the Washington Post saying that he had ordered Father DePaul not to return. And that if the Cardinal Sheehan wanted to take it up, that they would go to Rome and he would have Montini decide it. And he says, and the burden of proof is on him that it wasn't done. So it's at his expense, and he would go, and he says, we'll see, we'll let, uh, at that time he called him His Holiness, we'll let His Holiness decide who's right, you or I. Needless to say, she had knowing that he was a liar, back down. Although he never retracted the statements, the calumnious statements that he made against Father DePaul. So uh, I, I don't have very high hopes to where Larry went in the afterlife. Um, so now he was in New York. He was in uh, New York. He started out before he uh, was able to take over at the chapel. He rented out a room in the Pan Am building. And he was actually doing that since 1964. Whenever he came to the United States, he would offer the true mass there. And he took the small congregation that he had out to Westbury, Long Island. And that's where he started his fight for truth and tradition. And he uh, was he was prosecuted by everybody under the sun. He had a very interesting life. He continued to try to uh, do what he could. Uh, in 1970, on October 4th, he started the first radio mass. It was broadcast throughout the world. And it was at his own expense. Again, the, the, the money left to him by his father and the investments he made was the guiding, uh, was the guiding force that allowed him to do these things. And he gave talks around the nation he would go anywhere to talk anywhere. And then there was a lot of interesting things that happened to him. Um, to give you one time, there was actually, to show you how the Conclavist movement went, <clears throat> in 1966, uh, he had gone out to Chicago to give a talk at a hotel room, and there was a couple of hundred people present. And he gave a talk, and he told them to go back and demand the true mass and that, you know, the reforms of Vatican II should not be taken seriously, that we should go back to the way things were, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he would never see people, there was a question and answer section, but he would never see people individually because they usually just wanted to fight with him and tell him how he was a disobedient a priest and this and that and the other thing. But he would never refuse to see a priest that wanted to see him because he was hoping he could win him over. So this particular time, there was a priest in his, approximately 60 years old at the time, the ordained priest, of course, who said that he wanted to see Father DePoor after the talk, so he agreed. So he met, and there was with him uh, a modestly dressed, attractive woman in her mid-40s, and she said that, I'm not going to use the priest's real name, it's a father, you know, Father X is my uh, confessor, and he's my spiritual, uh, uh, he's my spiritual uh, guide, and such, such. Uh, you know, he helps me. Father Paul said, that's, that's very nice, I'm happy for you, but what does this have to do with the Father? And uh, Father said, uh, she has visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and uh, she has uh, a regular, uh, regular dialogue with her. So he looked at her, and she didn't look like she was, you know, off a rocker. And so he went back and said, well, why are you talking to me? How come you're not, you know, in the Vatican or with uh, you know, uh, the, the Archbishop of Chicago. He said, because the, uh, they have to deal with you. 
the, the apparition. So what's the mother's has to do with you? And he says, he says really? She goes, yes. Uh, if Paul VI has been removed from office and you've been mystically uh, crowned as the new pope, what shall be your title, your holiness? He goes, do not call me your holiness. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, this goes against Catholic theology. Uh, you know, God's not just going to come down and anoint somebody a pope. And I think I would have been made known about this in any case. So, uh, you know, please don't come near me again. And they said, well, we're going to keep following you until you uh, ex until you announce to the world that you're the pope. So for the next, believe it or not, for the next close to the year, whenever he gave a talk, who do you think was sitting in the back row? That priest and the woman waiting for him to make the announcement that never came. So he came. He started. Got creeped out because they were they were you know uh, stalking him basically. So he didn't want to get a priest unnecessarily in trouble. So he called the chancellery, and he said, "Look, I don't want this guy coming. You know, say whatever you have to, put him wherever you have to put him, but let it be known that he can't come anywhere near me because otherwise I'm going to have to take legal action." So eerily. The day before Father called the chancellery, uh, the priest in question left a note saying that he was leaving and never coming back. The woman that he was with had sold her house and left, and they were never heard or seen from again. <laughs> that is a bizarre story. And uh, yeah, that was that was the end of it. Um, after uh, uh, you know, after all these, uh, after all of these times showing up and what, and the the diocese, archdiocese of Chicago said he went missing without official leave, and they had no idea where he was. So imagine, you know, the father said, "This is just another example of how careful we have to be." Can you imagine if I had stood up and said, you know, I believe in these apparitions, or that, you know, I I'm some sort of a goofy, quote unquote, pope? the damage that I would have done it says we have to really uh, uh, people are going to want a quick fix. And he knew that a quick fix was not coming. He says, I don't know what the answer to this is. Uh, he still held on to like a recognizing kind of resist position until 1999 when, um, Wotila signed the Lutheran accord saying basically that justification by faith alone is right. And ever since then, he never, used, he would only call, uh, Wotila, John Paul II, never using his title Pope. He never used his name in the Mass, despite what some of the members of the Catholic Traditionalist Movement had said. I was there for years, and I sat in the first pew, and I heard what he said. He did not say the name of John Paul II in the Mass, and I can testify to that personally since at least 1999. And he called him the man at white in white at the Vatican. So that's pretty much the way it went. And so Father Paul was embattled. He had gone through a lot of things. And then it gave, uh, when they saw all that he was taking, then you saw the Lefevres and the Tooks and the Mendezes start coming up. But uh, I actually had a priest from the SSPV who I admire and respect very much said, truth be told, if there hadn't been a Father the Paul, there wouldn't have been uh, a Bishop Mendez or a Bishop Kelly or an Archbishop Lefevre because he was the first and he gave the way, he paved the way for us to seem sane and to try to come out with a way that we could get things back to normalcy again. And Father was my guide for all these years and I am forever grateful to him for that. And I started my blog uh, basically in honor of him because I had learned so much from him, from him over the years uh, that I decided that I, I had a duty, if you want to call it that, to share my learning and to share what I had gotten from him with everybody else. And that's what I do for my blog. And so then, um, I don't know if you mentioned, maybe, maybe I missed this, but, but when did, did he pass away? And then I guess, accordingly, how long did you know him? It must have been, must have been decades. Oh, yes. Uh, I met Father DePauw on August 9th, 1981. And he passed away. He went to his holy. Uh, he went to judgment uh, on May the sixth, two thousand and five. He was uh, he was just short of eighty-seven years old. Wow! 
and, and so did you have a, a personal relationship with him? It sounds like you've, you've heard many things from him, so you must have had a pretty pretty close. Oh, yes. We spoke on the phone. Uh, I had met with him many times. I have dozens of letters from him, uh, you know, uh, dozens of cards. Um, you know, uh, we kept, uh, he was my spiritual father, and we were close. Uh, he was the biggest guiding force in my life. And uh, I was one of the few people for whom he would always give a call back <laughs> because uh, he was always glad to hear from me. And uh, whenever I had a question, he would always answer it. Uh, he was there for me whenever I needed him. And yes, we were very close. And he actually taught me a lot of my basic theology. He told me what books to get, he told me what to study. Uh, he would correct me when I was wrong. And he would show me a lot of the, uh, he had a, a library, which was, second to none. I mean, uh, I have about 6,000 books that I've accumulated, but he had, the ones that he had were ones that you could never find, and they were all the originals in Latin, and he could read, write, and speak Latin fluently, uh, which all the parity had to be able to do at Vatican II. Uh, he also heard, uh, he, he was brilliant. I mean, he could read, write, and speak in eight languages fluently. Not just hello, goodbye, and how are you, like Wotila. Um, he Flemish, obviously. English, German, uh, Italian, uh, French, Greek, uh, Latin, and uh, Hebrew. And so he would, uh, he could hear confessions in any one of those eight languages. Surprisingly, Spanish wasn't one of them, so he couldn't help people in Spanish. But uh, yeah, if you confess to him in Latin, he, you know, that's why uh, Vatican II they didn't need to have translators. They didn't need to have people who, because they all understood Latin and they all spoke to each other in Latin. There were some exceptions, like the Bishop of Long Island at that time, which uh, it's called the Diocese of Rockwell Center, was a guy by the name of uh, Wolf Kellenberg. And Kellenberg, uh, Father the Paul, he said uh, he wasn't too bright. He came up to him and said, do you understand what's going on here? And he said, yes, Your Excellency. He goes, well, that makes one of us. He says, uh, I'm going to leave. He says, I'm going to do a tour of Italy. He says, and uh, let me know what happens when, when I get back. <laughs> and he left. Yeah. And these are the kinds of shenanigans that went on at the Second Vatican Council. And, you know, the, it, it, was, it was really, it was, uh, he, he described it as a circus. And he described it as a circus where there were bishops who were clueless and you had uh, the modernists running the show and you had a small core of traditionalists who were uh, traditionalists being the anti-modernists who were trying to keep this all in place. And his biggest opponent at the council was the suit and tie wearing Herr Ratzinger, who was uh, the paratist for springs and they clashed many a time at the council and it was right before the month before he died that Ratzinger claimed to be the so-called Pope so uh, he, he had been through a lot Bishop Kurz unfortunately went to his eternal reward and uh, well I shouldn't say that he went to judgment I like to think he went to his eternal reward in 1973 uh, and he reverted back to the diocese of Cardinal Ottaviani made it so that he would revert back to the Diocese of Tivoli and be allowed to do whatever he wants. Now, the reason why Father DePoy did that was that he had people who were attached to the papacy and he didn't want to lose them. So he never was open about what he believed so that, well, where does he get jurisdiction from? Why does he do this? You know, why am I bad? Because that's every kind of, oh, Father DePoy is working against the Vatican. But he had, if you want to call it that, the original indult. And because of that, he was able to maintain a lot of people across the spectrum of traditionalism and the recognizing resist would stay with him. Say the Vicatus would stay with him. Because, you know, and uh, the early few of them that there were at the time. And he maintained that delicate balance and he was trying to bring things together. Unfortunately, he never saw that happen in his lifetime. It's an incredible thing. And I think as, you look, as I listen to this, it's just amazing to try to put yourself in, that, in the place of someone who did it as you say, personally know these people and, and actually was was part of this. And then to, to be the armchair, the, the Monday morning quarterback, where you start to say, you know, 
well, why didn't he just admit say to make Conte? And it's, it's the same with Archbishop Lefebvre. And it's like, you know, yeah, sure. In hindsight, now looking back on it, what, 40 years later, yeah, maybe they should have done something. But it's such a different story when you're in the thick of it and you're literally just trying to maintain the Catholic faith. I mean, for goodness sake, I mean, how many people, I, I, again, as you listen to this, it's just incredible. I mean, how many people were just simply trying to retain tradition and for, you know, heroes like him and Archbishop Tuck and Archbishop Lefebvre, I mean, what they did was 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 uh, it was heroic, but maybe not always heroic. But it's it's something that I think I think we need to look at in the light of, of, of the times rather than our own yeah, armchairs. Exactly, you know, and I'm like you know, I I, often, I say on my blog too, you know, is that uh, <clears throat> even though I was trained by a canonist, I am not a canonist. I am not a theologian. Uh, I have no magisterial authority. And I'm just trying to make my best Catholic way I can through these perilous times. And if people want to agree with what I write, that's fine. If they don't, that's okay, too. I'm not going to be like the Diamond Brothers and say you're a mortal sin, you're a heretic, and you can burn in hell. I don't do that. Um, I just uh, apply what I've learned to the times, and this is what I think is the best way to go. And that's basically what the blog is about. Uh, my memories of Father the Poor sometimes as well. And uh, I try to, like Mario Dirksen, who is uh, who I know and who I have nothing but the greatest respect for, I consider him my friend. Steve Spore, who I know and I have nothing but the greatest respect for. Um, they are both great gentlemen. Uh, and their, uh, their blog and website are, are better than mine. Uh, they hone in on specifically one topic, and that is, uh, you know, uh, the, the false Vatican II sect and things like that. Mario specifically, uh, Steve has a little bit more leeway uh, with his blog, but I like to, uh, if you notice, if you ever go through my blog, I have very, very different topics each week, and that's because uh, I, I want to, uh, the, people aren't getting that anymore. People are not getting guidance with um, the various things they have to face. I love the SSPV. Uh, I really do. I know the bishops, I know the priests. Uh, with the exception of one priest uh, who is no longer in New York, I think they're a great group of people. I really do. And uh, But the one thing that I, one criticism that I have, and again, I'm sure they're doing it with the best of intentions, that when you're listening to their sermon, you feel like you're back in 1958 and everything is nice, nice, sweet, sweet, and we're all okay. Well, no, we're not. You know, we're not. And it, it's... When you work, when you leave, you're back in 2022, and all is not okay with the world. And what you need to do is you have to remind people, like, I know what I went through to become a traditionalist. People who are born now, there are people who are raised traditionalists who have no idea what it was like back before the age of computers to try to find somebody, which was like a needle in a haystack. And they have no idea what it was to try to preserve the faith. And they need to be reminded of the fact that you're not going here because we like Latin. We're not going here because we're attached to old things. We're not going here because, you know, we're eccentric. We're here because of the faith. And here are some real dangers to the faith that are coming up. And you should be made aware of this. You know, one of the things that you'll never hear, well, not in the SSPV, they will say things on occasion, but, you know, uh, the ordinary uh, Vatican II say Catholic will never hear things uh, about... Uh, the occult invasion, how uh, the occult is, is exploded everywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, here in New York City, are you kidding? You know, uh, uh, you know, my site is considered a hate site because I, I use the term site and I don't agree with the homosexual agenda and the trans, if the, 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 you know, trans, what, uh, trans garbage. It's, it's all uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And the effects that it's having. A lot of people say, well, you know, it doesn't affect you. Well, yeah, it does. It does. You know, uh, a man be a woman, and a woman can't be a man. I believe in the truth. And if you don't speak the truth, uh, well, it's going to have an effect on society. And it does have an effect against God. Not every sin is a sin against people. Uh, you know, if you use God's name in vain, it's an offense against God. And people forget that. And people forget a lot of things. And my, my purpose or what I try to do aim is to reorient, reorientate people into a traditionalist Catholic perspective on all of these things. 
So I'll warn people about certain things. I will present traditional Catholic doctrine on certain things. And I will, uh, you know, I will also, you know, go against Bergoglio and whatever happens as well. And that's basically how I see myself. Well, I hope I haven't talked too much. No, no, it's, it's great. I, I really appreciate it. And it's something that I, I talk about all the time on the podcast is this idea of spiritual warfare. And I, I think it's very real. I think it's all around us. And I think, you know, grace versus sin and, I mean, and devils versus angels. And it sounds kind of, I think... It, it, the world wants us to believe it's kind of a fairy tale, but I, I think it's it's very real. And so th this idea again of just how does it affect us? How does this public sin affect us? Is kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, what are you talking? Of course it affects us. I mean, it's all we're all in this together in this in this great you know, mystical body, and we are affected by everything, and, and, and in, individually and as a whole. And I think that's something as you said, people just don't they don't even they don't think of it that way anymore. They don't think of us as being part of a church. They think of us individually. You know? Oh, the transgender, you know, does it affect you? It's like, well, I mean, are you talking physically or what are you talking about? <laughs> because of course, yeah, right. I mean, what are you talking <laughs> about? I mean, it, it is so, it's, it's, but it shows you how the world has twisted people's understandings of the faith. I mean, what is the church and who are the members and, and what are they responsible for, I suppose? And that's great. I, I really appreciate it. I, I really appreciate blogs like yours and, and Stephen's parades, who's another friend of mine, if I can call him that. Mario is just amazing. The work that you guys do because you're totally right i mean who's saying this i just saw the other day i think it was the new york times that had a post about trying to normalize cannibalism cannibalism <laughs> i'm pretty sure oh. it was the new york times I i'm not kidding they're they like it was like the wildest thing i've ever seen i, I thought it was like babylon b and then i looked again and it's like i'm pretty certain it was new york times it's like what on earth i mean it's seriously you think you can't get crazier and then it does it just when you think it's reached the uh, the lowest point possible, they prove you wrong. I know. Unbelievable. Well, I, I seriously appreciate this. It's been a great. I, I mean, I truly appreciate learning about Father DePaul. I mean, I don't think we can know enough about these these heroes of our faith. I mean, these these are the men who I if the world lasts another couple hundred years, they're going to be written about as Saint Athanasius. I mean, I don't know if they're saints, but they are still in the same realm, in, in my opinion. They, they have held together the faith. You know, our, our traditionalist bishops and priests right now are doing the same. You know, they, they are many, in many cases, single-handedly, you know, one priest to a, a, a state. I mean, it's, it's absolutely heroic. It's incredible. So don't forget, all you people watching this, do not forget, please, don't forget to pray for them. Because the, the evils that they must go against every day, the evils Father DePaul must have faced, I, I can't even fathom it the devils that must be attacking them. So please pray for our priests, pray for our bishops, pray for all of our religious, and pray for the Catholic Church. Pray for all the members of the Catholic Church and that we as a whole can find success, can find a hope, and individually can reach eternity. Intro, Evo, can, can I get a last word from you, perhaps about Father DePaul or, or whatever you want? Last words. Sure. Uh, Father DePaul, he had... Uh... He always, uh, when I said, when I asked him one time, I said, you know, how do I know what to do, Father? How do I know? And he took me back to the sacristy, and it told me everything. I, he had three plaques on the wall, and he said, this is what I live my life by. And it was interesting. One was by Davy Crockett. He said, first, make sure you're right, then go ahead and do it. Second one was by St. Athanasius. He said, if the whole world goes against the truth, then I must go against the whole world. And the third one, he says, and this is how he offered his mass. It was, I miss it, because no priest before or since has ever offered the mass like he did. And it said, priest of Christ, offer this mass as if it were your first mass, as if it were your last mass, as if it were your only mass. And he pointed to me and said, make sure that when you attend mass, you attend it as if it were your first as if it were your last, as if it were your only. Just live by these three mottos, and you can be sure that God will help you do the right thing. Beautiful. I love it. Perfect, perfect way to end it. I really appreciate it. Anyone who wants to check out the blog, I will attach a link in the description. It's a, it's kind of hard to read out, so I'm not even going to try it, but I will attach a link. 
always good stuff as as, as he says it's it's every it's weekly and good content that ranges all over the place and cannot recommend it enough please go check that out if you like this show please like share subscribe let your friends know and and hey let your friends know that they can come on here and learn a little bit more about a true hero of the faith father go Marco paul thank you so much intro evo and I, I truly hope to have you on again until next time perhaps god bless yes thank you <laughs>